God's people said? Amen. 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 You may be seated. We had a request uh, a few weeks ago saying they are missing the choir on Sunday nights. So we're going to come back. We're going to sing Sunday nights. We're going to sing Praise the Lamb medley. <laughs> y'all being back on Sunday night. Let's make our way down and uh, give them just a moment. Stand with me just a second and uh, give them time to get settled and you take a moment to greet some folks. We're glad to have family visiting from Kentucky and Tennessee. Just to take just one moment. We'll come back and have missions moment in just a second. Let the choir go down, find their place and find your spot just a moment together.
Let's find your places. Join me in this song. Send the light. Their calls are ringing. Oh, the restless waves send the light. Let's all sing this together. There's a call comes ringing o'er the restless way. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. On the last, let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light, let us gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light, send the light. In the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. In the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Amen. All right, you may be seated. I want to talk to you just a moment. We're going to have a missions moment in just a second. I want the men to get ready up on the sound booth. On the 21st of this month, on a Sunday evening, 21st, we're not going to have our regular service. Uh, what I want to do that night, we've been trying for months now to plan to get all of our, our, our workers and, and leaders together, and it's just so hard. Our schedules are so busy. Uh, we are the busiest small church I know. I mean, we, we project so much more uh, than really the ministry the Lord's given us. We stay busy. We're active. And it's hard to get everybody together. And so on the 21st, this is for folks that serve in a ministry. Uh, you serve in the coffee shop. You serve in the choir. You serve in Sunday school, any of the children's ministry, any outreach ministries. Uh, you teach. Uh, because I want to talk to you. Uh, it'll be a very casual. It'll be casual. It's just a, we're going to eat together. It's, it's uh, just come so I can talk to you and uh, just kind of share some things on our hearts, some things we're thinking. Sometimes decisions are made. Uh, at the top, as it were, and uh, we didn't get enough input from uh, all across the board. And so I want to have a time that we sit down. We want to plan some things for this summer and uh, just kind of think about the future and where we're going. So uh, we'll have a children's program that night. We're gonna, we'll probably turn them loose in the gym. We'll probably meet in the MCA or something like that. But it'll be just a time for me to sit down with all of our folks that are involved in leadership and just have a good conversation I'm not really going to preach to you. I'm not going to teach to you that much. But uh, just talk about some things that I have on my heart and on my mind as we move forward. I think we need to be on the same page and we need to be progressing forward. Uh, big goals, big dreams, big ideas. But at the same time, I want to make sure that we're all striving together. All right, striving together. And so on the 21st, make plans. You say, preacher, I don't have a ministry. Well, that's a great night to take off and enjoy. Or you have a couple of weeks before now to get in a ministry, okay? And I just want to get those that are involved in doing the work, those that are involved in making the work happen. In every church, there are some that do the work, there are some that watch the work, and there are some that wonder what happened at the work, all right? They have no idea what's going on. So if you're involved, uh, I want you to be at that meeting and we'll have a great time. I think we'll have some food that night. Is that the plan? We'll have a little food and fellowship, casual dress, and uh, just a uh, time for me to sit down and talk with you. We found out that meetings on Sunday night, Brother Pranger, this will help you. If you're trying to find meeting times, you've already got Sunday night. They're already here. And a lot of times you can have uh, two or three things going on at one time, be a blessing. But schedules are difficult. Well, we've got March for Life coming up, Walk for Life. And uh, this is something that we want to partner with uh, for a couple of reasons. One, we want to raise awareness that there are options outside of abortion. So many young women, now if you're a Christian school, Christian home, church like ours, you have been taught that there are options beside abortion. But if you're secularized, secular school, secular home, unwanted pregnancy automatically means termination of the baby. And so we partner with several nonprofits in our community to try to rescue babies, but not just rescue babies, but help moms after the fact uh, raise those kids and get involved. And the, the Bible declares that we as Christians are salt and light. The light is to show the way, the gospel. Salt 
is a preserving agent. And uh, salt is there to not stop what is already corrupted, but it's to keep it from spreading. And we were downtown, I think, two or three years ago, and Quinn and Annabelle was part of the group that walked with us, and we were uh, at the, the other March for Life. And they said, Daddy, why do we do this? I said, to let the world know there are options beyond the ones you're being told. And so many people don't realize that there are great alternatives, and there are people that for free as a ministry will provide services. So uh, the Greitzers and uh, Jen Greitzer and Carmel Sequin uh, partnering with a local group here. I want you to come out. It'd be great for your kids to get involved. It'd be great for you to get involved. And I want to show this brief video and uh, the dates for that. Or, or we'll make those announcements and all that. But if you can be, you ought to be involved in what's happening locally. Uh, the Marins do a great job, Rebecca and Scott. And uh, right here, just literally a stone's throw from our property. They help save babies every day of the world. Turn your attention to the screen and let's watch this brief video. It's a beautiful day at 76 degrees. There's a nice breeze. God's here with us and we're here with about, I'd say two or 300 people that really love babies. Last year, 352 moms and dads came to faith. A staggering 360 babies whose lives were saved. Fourth North Shore Park down in St. Pete. If you're available, I'd love you to come down and be a part of that. Ushers, you come. Let's receive the offering tonight and ask the Lord to bless that. Dr. Mills is going to come and give us our memory verse for the week. And if you have any questions about the Walk for Life, see Jen or Carmel. They'll answer that. You call the office, Nicole, and she'll answer that as well. But uh, this is our time to worship in giving. Church family, be faithful in your regular giving. Dr. Mills, you pray for the offering and give our memory verse, please. Our Father, as we give this evening, we have you in mind. We're placing, Lord, our offering, not in a plate, but in your hand, to be used to glorify you and to spread the gospel around the world. We ask your blessing upon what is giving and those who are giving. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Bible memory verse for this week is from none other than Peter himself. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, and I want you to remember that Peter was the kind of apostle that was always putting his sandal in his mouth. But he learned later in life what was really important, and he wrote something down for us that we should never forget. Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. First Peter chapter five, verses six and seven, great memory verse to carry you through this week and for a lifetime. Amen. Let's all stand, sing one last time this evening. Living hope, how great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. Let's sing this. How great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation.
tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ is my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ is my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the seated. Amen. All right, let's find Second Thessalonians tonight and uh, appreciate those of you that came out this afternoon to uh, Harvey Guptill's service. We had a sweet homegoing service. I spoke to a crowd of people. The MCA was full and uh, the vast majority were folks from their, uh, their, their um, village there they live and uh, friends from Maine. I had no idea so many Mainers we're down in this part of the country, but we had a tremendous service, and the gospel was given. Appreciate those of you that came out. Uh, just remember now how quickly, quickly life changes. He was making plans to be here last Sunday morning, and uh, coming for Easter, slipped and fell, and uh, passed away Tuesday. So you never know when life is going to change, what phone call will happen that will forever upend your life. Pray for Joan and uh, that family, please. Now, I want you to look at verse number 6 tonight. We pick up reading in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. The Bible says, Now, we command you, brethren, this is a command, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourself from every brother that walketh a little differently than you do. Is that what it says? It doesn't say that. It says, from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the traditions that we have set in our own personal. No, that's not what it says. The traditions which we receive, which he received of us, for yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. 
not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you, follow us. For even when we were with you, we, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that, without, uh, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. If any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle. So I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Now busy or busy bodies. Busy about the business of the Lord's work or a busy body. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. I want you to understand that Paul is writing to the church here, Thessalonica, the church born of persecution, strong church, a good church, a church that's trying to serve the Lord. And he writes a second time about how to deal with those that are disorderly, how to deal with those that are disorderly. Now, we call this sometimes church discipline. Uh, how do you handle church discipline? How do you deal with those that are causing trouble, that are not being obedient to the Scripture? So first of all, I want you to look at a clear command to withdraw from that brother. A clear command. And that's what he said. He said, I command you that you withdraw. Look what it says there, verse number 6. We command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves. Now, he mentions that this is according to what they have received of us. Not tradition of men, but the tradition that was the apostles' doctrine. What they were teaching, what they were showing. He, he emphasizes that again, what you've seen in our life. So number one, the basis for all withdrawal must be the standard of the word of God. Now, in every relationship in your life, mark this down. Measure it by the lens of the word of God. Is this relationship good for me according to the scripture? Is this relationship bad for me according to the, uh, the, to the, to the scripture? In every relationship. Now, you say, preacher, I, I don't like that. You know why you don't like that? Because you know that there are some relationships that we get caught up in and caught up with that are contrary to the word of God. Now, mark this, you can be friends with people who are lost. You can be friends with the world as far as trying to love them and witness to them, but you cannot be with them or eventually what they believe, you will believe. What they do, you will do. Uh, you do not go from the stronger, uh, from the weaker to the stronger position so many times. You go from the stronger to the weaker position. So mark this, your close associates here in the house of God, those around you, you have to make a standard of the word of God. And that's a big deal today because so many people live contrary to the word of God. I made a decision years ago that if I was going to serve the Lord, I would have to sever some relationships. If I was going to serve the Lord, I'd have to stay around people that wanted to love God and love his word and love the church and love the work of the church. And so mark this, measure every relationship in the house of God. What do we do? We look at everything through the word of God. What we do in the house of God ought to be done at your house. What we do here, every decision has to have a principle or a precept. We're trying to wet wrestle and weigh through some decisions. Is there Bible for this? Is there scripture for this? Is there principle for this? Uh, what is it that we do? And whatever it is we do, it must be seen through the lens of the word of God. Now, I cannot emphasize this enough. Every decision must be precept or principle. Every decision must be precept or principle. If I do it, I have to show you um, a Bible precept. Here we go. Look at that. Or a Bible principle. I've spoken twice already today, and this is the third time. I'm doing great. I never thought I'd get this far today. But this cold is whipping my bottom. Uh, 
cough medicine and cold syrup. Praise the Lord, okay? And now we will not do pages in prayer tomorrow. That's, that's a no-brainer. We won't do pages in prayer tomorrow, so no pages in prayer. But we'll be fine tonight. Now, <clears throat> mark this. Your decisions must be scriptural. Now, when it comes to people, how quickly do we walk away? And here's the question, why do we walk away? Why do we walk away? What is this person doing that I can no longer be in close fellowship with them in the church or in my life? Now, notice what it says. It says, uh, these people here, we command you, brethren, withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, that walketh disorderly. Now, this is an idea in the verbiage here, and you can study the verbs out for yourself, but in the verbiage here, the idea is not a lapse, not a one-off, but a persistent practice or direction. So the sin that is so great that we would literally have to cause ourselves to this fellowship is not someone that stumbles or falls or has a moment, but someone who has made a conscious decision to go a different direction. A conscious decision to go a different direction. And I, I just want you to be clear about that, that it is something that when you look at their life, you see a person that is not going toward God. That, that is not pursuing Christ. That is not trying. You said, preacher, there's a lot of sinners in the church. If there were no sinners in the church, there'd be no church. It's not about, oh my goodness, Ira messed up, or preacher messed up, or, or so-and-so messed up. We all mess up. But I'm going to tell you something. Week in and week out, day in and day out, most of us that are here tonight, if you're here on a Sunday night, God bless your heart. You are striving to know Christ. You are seeking to grow in Christ. As Peter said, you're building up, you're adding to, you're strengthening your faith. And you say, oh, they blew it. I'm done with them. I'm not talking about a one-off. I'm talking about a conscious decision. I'm talking about someone who has rejected Christ. I'm someone who, talking about someone who has rejected the Bible, someone who's rejected Christianity, someone who has rejected uh, what we do in this place. Now that should limit how many people you got to let go. That should limit. We are quick to cut off for all the wrong reasons. Uh, it is interesting that this is a slow process. Now, if you go back in 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul had already warned them in verse number 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble mind, support the weak, be patient toward all men. But, but apparently this problem is still continuing that, that they're not getting it. So he says, look, you're trying to give them grace and give them room. I would rather, church, listen to me now, a long time doing this, I would rather err on the side of grace than justice. If I have to err, I'm going to err with too many chances and not enough chances. Because the purpose, the purpose here is for us not to punish them the purpose is not for us to hurt them. The purpose for us is to win them, uh, to bring them back. And so we want to give opportunity. Sometimes a person stumbles and they're going through a hard time. That's the time that the church ought to come alongside and uh, gather them in and help them and nurture them and protect them and try to bring them back. That's not time to shoot the wounded. Sometimes people make terrible life choices. Oh, they blow it. And boy, we're quick to say, man, I knew it. I knew it. And we start slinging arrows and stones. My heart breaks for that person. My heart longs to see that person brought back into a right relationship with God and to the church. And so the slowness of this, if somebody is going through it, you, you talk about it, our Christian school, it's a wonderful example. Sometimes we have a student that just is not getting it, is not getting it, and we're patient, and we're patient, and we're patient. And at some point, maturity kicks in or other things kick in, whatever it is, and the light goes on, and all of a sudden, they make a turn. Listen, if we kick everybody out because they got one wrong answer, we'd kick everybody out. Same is true in the church. The slowness of our 
our, our withdrawal is we want to give people room to grow. By the way, do you know why you want to give people room to grow? Because you want room to grow. How would you like everybody to treat you the way you treat your body? How would you like everybody to treat you the way you treat everybody? Preacher, what are you going to do about it? I was 27 years old, 26 years old. Tom Malone was my pastor. We had a, we had a guy in the church that was going the wrong direction. And I went to him. I said, Doc, I said, uh, we got this guy. I said, he's going the wrong direction. I said, he's messing around. I said, we got to deal with it. And Dr. Malone looked at me and said, now, Brent, he said, let's pray about that. I said, ain't no need to pray about this. He's going in the wrong direction. I know he's in the wrong direction. It's black and white. It's clear. Let's drop the hammer on him. Dr. Malone said, no, no, let's pray about it. I got indignant. I got angry. I said, we don't need to pray. We need to act. He said, no, we need to pray. Now, all these years later, some young man comes to me and says, let's act. You know what I say? Let's pray about it. Let's pray about it. We, we got to make sure. We got to make sure. The hallmark of our ministry for 27 years is a place the wounded could come and get help. It's been the hallmark. Of, I've had preachers say, and this is to God be the glory, our church can't help you but go to Brent's. That's the kind of church you need to wounded, broken people. And we've, we've seen some wonderful turns and some great, some great redemption stories here. We've seen some awful things here. But I, I want to make sure that when we err, we err on the side of grace. Err on the side of grace. Now, Paul writes about church discipline the goal in 1 Corinthians 5, in the name of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver, one, uh, deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now that sounds like our goal is to punish, but you don't stop reading there. 1 Corinthians 5 goes on to say that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Church, our goal is not punishment, but salvation, restoration, reconciliation. And, and so we, we must realize that there are going to come times when people have to be set aside and we have to withdraw. And I understand that. And the command is when they make a willful decision to walk away, then we say, you know what, walk on. But we're not talking about the weak and the wounded and those that are struggling and those that are growing we're talking about those who are willfully against us now when it comes to the matter of doctrine that is something that we have to be deliberate on people come in all the time and they say hey uh, we believe this and I'm like that's wonderful we don't well we think this that's great we don't well would you consider nope settled now, I'm wonderfully uh, open to people. I love people. I love all stripes, all sizes, all colors. And uh, I can have some fellowship with folks that, that believe differently. Uh, but let me tell you, when it comes to the church, when it comes to doctrine, what we've received of the Lord, uh, we have to be deliberate. And when someone says, hey, we're going that way, we say, God bless you, go on. But we're not. Now, we can have fellowship, we can have friendship, we can have associations, we can work together in some ways, but in the church, doctrine is the main thing. And you say, well, doctrine is difficult, doctrine divides. The answer is yes. Doctrine does divide. And if you begin to not divide over doctrine, it will not be long before there's nothing left to divide in the first place. Not everybody's on the same page and God bless I can give room to folks but once we settle on it in the church it must be settled but watch this never to change now that is not preference that is not practice that is not institutional guidelines there are a lot of things around here that are just institutional we don't have thus saith the Lord so we make an institutional guideline we have to uh, the Bible tells the pastor to set things in order. And sometimes I wish the Bible said, thou shalt have a, a haircut that equals X, Y, Z. We don't have that. 
The Bible doesn't say thou shalt have a hemline that falls at this point in the body. Uh, thou shalt wear these clothes or not. The Bible doesn't give specifics. So we have institutional standards. Those are things that we just have to set in place. Clint and I spent a couple of hours this week just walking through some institutional standards so that we're on the same page. Now, you said, preacher, can somebody be different in practice or preference and be right in doctrine? A hundred percent. hundred percent. Can I give people room? A thousand percent. A thousand percent. What we're talking about here is not quibbling over second or third tier issues. We're talking about doctrine. Doctrine. The word of God. People that are willfully against the word of God. Willfully against the word of God. And this is, again, a set pattern. Not somebody that trips and falls. Not somebody that's questioning. I think one of the things that we've hurt ourselves is when we've had kids that ask questions, we shoot them down because they're in rebellion. Sometimes they're not in rebellion. They're seeking answers. And we must entertain those questions so they can come to the right conclusion. Don't shoot down a questioner. He may be working out his salvation. He may be walking through a process. Answer his question. You may be embarrassed because you don't have a Bible answer for his question. That's the reason you shoot him down. But if you have a Bible answer for his question or her question, you can give them that Bible answer. So I'm just saying that the command is clear. And there are times that we have to say no. But it's not for those that are trying or struggling or striving. It is for those that have walked away. And when they walk away, watch this. The church must let them go. Now, how do you know somebody's walking away? Number two, we watch this command given by God. Now, it's interesting. It's all in the context of the passage. We take two or three verses out of this text to bring some other truths out. But when you look at the command, you're watching a pattern of life and ministry. Now watch this. By the way, let me say this. The church is a privilege, not a right. The church is to be protected by the word of God because it's a privilege to be a member of the church, not a right. Now watch this. He says, for, verse 10, for, in verses uh, seven, eight, nine. He said, "You know us. We didn't steal from you. We didn't rob you. We we worked. Uh, we we gave our effort, our, our our night and day. We would not be chargeable to you. We earned our keep." Now, verse ten. For even when we were with you, we this we commanded uh, commanded you that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. But are busy bodies. Now them that are such. We command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and they eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Now here's a signature of someone who's trying to hurt the work of Christ. He's not busy working. He's a busy body. A busy body. Now, if you are a member of the church, if you're a Christian, you're to be fervent in your work. And that's what Paul lays out here. He said, we should work. Those with the ability to work should work. If you're able, you should be engaged in life and ministry. No one should let others pay their way. We, we should work. We should be fervent in our work. If we're fervent in our work, we're going to be focused on what we have to do. We're going to be focused on our responsibility. We're going to be focused on our Christian life. We're going to be focused on our service, our ministry, our right here in front of us. The idea here that Paul gives a play on words, there are many people who are busy, and then there are busy bodies who do no business. When you're busy, I've often said this, those, those that are rowing the boat don't have time to rock the boat. When, 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 I, when I think about this, now, now listen to me. I love you and I'm your pastor. And so there's part of me that needs to know what's going on in your life. Shepherds and sheep must be together. I understand that. But when you come to me and you say, did you know what Ira's doing? 99% of the time, the answer is going to be no. Did you know what Frank's doing? Did you see Frank's post on social media? Did you see so-and-so's picture? 
99% of the time, the answer is going to be no. Do you know why? I don't have time. I literally don't have time. I'm so, listen, I'm sure that Ira is a mess. I mean, I'm completely confident that Abby would tell me that Ira is a mess. Can I get a witness, Abby? By the way, celebrating 39 years saved today. 39, he got saved Easter Sunday 39 years ago. 10 years after he married Abby, and then a couple of years later, Abby got saved. But I'm confident that Ira has got issues and hang-ups. And, and, and I mean, if I wanted to, I'm sure I could spend a lot of time investigating what a sorry, worthless, no count, am I getting in the right direction there, Christian Ira is. But you know what I figured out a long time ago, 32 years ago? I'm a sorry, worthless, no count Christian, and I got to work on me and I got to take care of me, and I got responsibilities for me and my wife and my family, and I don't have time. I'm too busy to be a busy body. Be focused. Be focused. It's interesting to me. I get two kind of phone calls. I get hundreds of phone calls, but I get two kind of phone calls. I get phone calls from busy people, and they have problems and solutions. I get, when I get a phone call, let, let's just say Clint. He's nodding his head in agreement. Clint doesn't call me. In fact, Clint has a cell phone for no apparent reason in the world. I call him on the phone, no answer. No answer, he, whatever. If Clint calls me, I'm thinking there's something that needs to be addressed because Clint is a busy person. And Clint calls me. He said, I preacher, I just want to let, about two Saturdays ago, I called him on the phone. I said, hey, uh, I just got a phone call. We got a problem. Let's, let's, let's get some things in motion. And within two hours, we had it solved and moving forward. Uh, busy people call me, and I know it's a busy person call. There's going to be a problem. And, and I, I, I don't mind busy people call. I have, this precious family right here wants to meet with me this week. And they said, I know you're busy. That's a good busy meeting with families and, and, and ministering and, and answering questions and, and witnessing. Those are good things. Busy people have busy people problems. I get a second kind of phone call. Nicole's up in the sound booth. She, they run the sound booth. That's the Whirly Suite up there. Nicole will call me and say, hey, so-and-so called you. And immediately, what do I do, Nicole? Oh, no. Oh, my word. What is wrong now? Because it's not a busy call, it's a busy body call. And 99% of my busy body calls are, Pastor, I'm upset because, fill in the blank. Somebody did this, somebody said that, there wasn't this, there wasn't that. Uh, this was wrong, the color was, I mean, it's, and I'm thinking, I hate busy body calls because I know this person is not busy enough if they're calling to tell me what's wrong. By the way, I know what's wrong. I'm the pastor. I can see we have a lot of issues. I know that. What I'm trying to do is fix those problems. I'm not trying to point out all those problems. Busy bodies are busy with no business. Busy people don't have time. And if a busy person has a problem, watch this, it's actually a problem. It's actually something that needs to be addressed and dealt with. And nine times out of ten, not only do they have a problem, they have a solution with the problem, or at least an idea of a solution. But busy bodies, all they do is spend their time checking what other people are doing. If you've got time to be busy about everybody else, I would suggest you get busy for yourself. That goes with pastors and missionaries too, Brother Pranger. If you've got time to tell me what everybody else is doing, I don't know what you're doing because I'm too busy doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Now, I want you to see a verse we take con out of context, and I've preached it out of context, and I've prayed it out of context, and I've lived it out of context, but it's, and it's good out of context, but it's better in context, amen. Verse 13, but ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Be not weary in well-doing, and uh, out of context, you know, talked about not quitting and not giving up and all those things, that's great, it's wonderful, but here's what that verse is actually saying in context of 1 Thessalonians 3, uh, don't stop being busy. Don't stop doing good. 
don't stop what is right. Don't, don't quit being a good Christian. I'm tired today. I'm sick, sick and tired. Everybody, you may be sick or tired, but I'm sick and tired. But uh, I'm sick, I'm tired in what I am, not of what I am. Physically, we can be tired in the ministry, but thank God I'm not tired of the ministry. I'm not tired of what God's called me to do. And so the idea here is to be faithful. And uh, right now, uh, many people are going through it. And dear friends, I've got a personal close friend that came to a place where he just got tired and literally walked away. Just walked away. Walked away from his church, walked away from his family, not in gross and moral sin, just tired. Just tired. And, and I, 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 I'm telling you, I'm not blasting him. I'm not blowing him up because I understand that eventually and at some points in your life, even the best of us can just say, that's it. That's it. So the idea here is stay busy. Don't get discouraged. Don't quit. Don't fall out by the way. Uh, be fervent in your work. Be focused on your work. Now watch this. When you get busy wondering what everybody else is doing, you get all focus and you get to comparing yourself. Comparing yourself with yourself is unwise. Comparing yourself with others is unwise. God didn't call you to be them. God didn't call them to be you. He called you to be you and them to be them. Focus on you and not them. Focus on what God's called you to do and keep the main thing in your life, the central, the main thing, and don't worry and don't quit. Now, he said this. He closes. He said, the command is when you see someone who is busy body, that's a sign that they're going in the wrong direction. They're going in the wrong direction. And so you need to admonish them. You need to rebuke them. Uh, you need to, to, to listen. Verse 14, if any man obey not our word by this epistle, Note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now, here's the three thoughts and we're finished. When you come to the command here is to work, the command is to withdraw, but the goal of this is to always win that person. So the first thing that we notice here is we are, now watch this, this is going to blow your mind. We are to notice what other people are doing. Now, I just said, keep busy, but you can't help but watching and seeing. Now, you say, preacher, the Bible says, judge not. That has nothing to do with being aware of the actions and activities of others. We are to be aware. You say, preacher, I didn't know. Is it that you didn't know or you didn't want to know? I didn't know they were doing this. I didn't know. Listen, I have a responsibility as a husband, as a father, as a pastor to know what's going on, to know the state of the flock, as it were. And when people are going against that, whether they're in the choir and they're gossiping or they're in the Sunday school or the school or the church or wherever they are, if they are going against what God is doing, I'm to be aware of that. I'm to notice that. Now he says, note them, note them. That mean, doesn't mean write a sticky note to them. That means to mark them. That means to identify them. Romans chapter 16 says it this way. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which we have learned and avoid them. So if somebody will not get right when they've been approached, and go back to Matthew and talk through the steps of proper approaching them, going one-on-one, -on -one, two on one through prayer and patience, if they will not turn, you mark them, you note them, hey, that person is against what God is doing. But watch this. Independent Baptists have taken this verse out of their Bible because that verse does not stop there. It says, count him not as an enemy, verse 15, but admonish him as a brother. Admonish him as a, he's not my enemy, an enemy, enemy. He's my brother. I am not to treat him as an enemy. 
I, again, want to err on the side of grace. But when I do have to withdraw, I want to do it in such a way that that person knows that I'm speaking the truth in love. And I love him so much, I'm willing to speak the truth. Uh, I have a, a tendency sometimes to, to, to go too far, and I understand that. I, I, was, I was in a staff meeting one time, and one of our staff ladies said, uh, you err on the side of grace. I said, you want me to err on the side of justice? She said, oh, no, no, no. We like the grace side. But my wife will tell you, when I do come to that place, sometimes I can be so much grace that when you have to draw the line, you can become uh, angry or hard. And that's a danger for me. I give you grace, grace, grace. All right, you're done. And then once you're done, now the nuclear option. You know, that's what, that's what we say at the house. Oh, dad's nuclear option exploded. I've got to be careful with that. That I can not agree with you and not treat you like an enemy. I heard a guy say one time, well, they're our Baptist cousins. I can't find Baptist cousin anywhere in the Bible. They're either our brother or they're not. They're either family or not. You know, they're either brothers and sisters or not. And my thought on that was, I don't have to like everything you do. I don't have to agree with everything you do. But if you name the name of Christ, my goal is to bring you back. And watch this. You're never going to win them when you're hateful, arrogant, condescending. You're not going to do that. Some of you, some of you watch this stuff, and I hope you never get involved, but you watch this stuff on social media. We are going to get to heaven, and we're going to find not one person ever been convinced of an argument through posting on social media. I'm convinced not one person is ever going to change their position because they got into a mudslinging contest on social media. If you got a problem with somebody, go talk to them. Sit down with them. If you can't work it out, get a friend. Friends talk to friends. If friends can't work it out, get a, get a group of friends. Get a council together. If worse come to worse, go your separate ways. Mark it. Say, hey, look, they're going away from us. That's fine. Let them go. But hey, God bless you. I love you. I walk into grocery stores every day around this, around this town, and I see people, hardware stores, convenience stores, Home Depot, whatever it is, and I see people that, that walked away. Hey, I'm not your enemy. I'm not your enemy. Now, I, I, I'm not chasing you down the hardware store aisle, but I'm not your enemy. You can come. I want to leave the door open. It's funny. Over the years, people have come back. People have come back, and they said, you think I could come back here? I never thought you should have left in the first place. So there are lines. There are clear lines. Clear doctrine lines. You just have to say that you're done. Clear attitude lines. We, we had some situations here lately where we just we said, look, your attitude is causing division. We're not going to put up with that. I told Clint the other day, I said, I'm never going to put up with a divisive attitude, especially when I pay a salary. I got problems without paid salary, much less with paid salary. We're not going to have divisive spirits. We're not going to have angry spirits. We're not going to have critical spirits. That's, that's, a, that's a busybody spirit. So we're going to mark them. We're going to love you. We're not going to hurt you. We're not going to be angry with you. But we're going to clearly draw the line. But the goal is for you to get your heart right, get, get turned around. So you can come back and do something great for God. Don't be so quick to cut people off. So one thing I think, one of the great lessons of ministry all these years Give people time to come around. To come around. You know, it's interesting. I was, I was writing something for Alan Courtright this week. And uh, Alan has a, you mind if I share this? Good. Um, Alan has a, a temperament that whatever you tell him the first time is always wrong. Like, Alan, I want to do this, and he'll give you like 50 reasons of why it's wrong. Now, 15 years ago, that would have bothered me, and that did bother me. But what I've learned with Alan Courtright is give him two days, and he'll come around to thinking that's the greatest idea in the history of the world. I just have to give him time to process. By the way, you know who else is like that? Me. 
My, my, my wife tells all the time, kids, he's not mad. He just has to process it. If we do not give people time to process and come around, we're going to lose, by the way, the most faithful friend in ministry I've had these last 15 years, somebody that had to have time to process, learn. Don't cut somebody off so quick just because they don't think like you or act like you or move like you or react like you. Give them time. Give them time. When you've given time and they've proven that they're not going to respond, you got to cut them off. And I mean that. you got to come. Now, again, that's a slow burn. That's a slow process. You say, well, preacher, we're, we're trying to hurt them. No, we want them to realize being part of this church is a wonderful privilege. And out of this church and out of the will of God is misery so they can repent and run home as the prodigal son. And when they come home, we don't say, I told you so. We say, welcome home. Amen. Welcome home. Let's kill the fatted calf. Let's grab the robe and the ring. Let's throw a party that son which was dead is now alive. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm an independent Baptist. It's funny, and I have to say this. I'm an independent Baptist. But I don't want us to be known as that angry, hard, where everybody's the devil and everybody's wrong and we're the only ones right. We're not the only ones right, and not everybody's the devil. The devil's real. And we know he's real because we see the word. We see the word. But I want us to be careful that we don't have that spirit, that attitude. And if we're going to err, let's err on the side of grace. But at the same time, we cannot put up with foolishness or busybodies or bad doctrine or direction. So it's this beautiful line. Give people room until they willfully say, I'm done. Okay, you've made your choice. Now we'll make ours. Father, tonight I pray that as we just kind of talk to our family this evening, Lord, that we would get the sense of grace and forgiveness, understanding the purity of the doctrine of the church, the, the reality of that not everybody is going to do exactly as we would do or think exactly as we would think. But, Lord, we can give them room as long as they abide by the Scripture. And, Lord, we can give them opportunity to come around to the Scripture. Bless our people. Bless our church. May we have an active, busy week of serving you and be engaged in the work you've called us to do. Now we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together just quietly, and I'm going to give a verse or two of invitation uh, just real quickly tonight. If God's speaking, I'm going to ask Ira to play, and the folks are moving to ministry positions. But if God's speaking to you, the time will be open. The altar is open. You can play there at your, you can pray right there at your seat. But God's speaking to you this evening. God's speaking to me this evening. God's speaking to you. Just a moment, and then I want you to come and use this altar. Relationships are too valuable. Relationships are too important. We work too hard to cut people off. And because relationships are important and valuable, we must guard them with Scripture. We must guard them with Scripture.
All right, you may be seated. Uh, we, we had a plethora of announcements this morning. Some folks are still praying. Give them plenty of time. We're, we're not going to go through all of those announcements. But uh, let me say, we, we have slipped up a little bit. Uh, Easter uh, being a big day has kind of got our attention off. But I want to remind you that we're tracking our tracks, okay? And this is just a spur. You know, it's so interesting. I gave out, and I was at Sherwin-Williams the other day getting some paint. And we just had a really good conversation. And I started to walk out uh, without giving a track. And I thought, man, how can I not give a track? I'm, 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 I'm encouraging you to track and pass out tracks. And so I went back in, and both men took the tracks. They were both excited about it. Neither one. I uh, just said, hey, man, come and visit any time. And it was, it was fine. But every Sunday now on the back table, next Sunday, we will have some signage up to remind you. So when you come in Sunday morning, now, if you did not last week, we didn't track any tracks last week because we forgot. So if you, if you have tracks from last week, just write them down with this week's total and on the back table, uh, fill in those, those track reports. Uh, I give a report every Sunday night to the group that we're partnering with, Phil America. And uh, they asked me last week, and I said, we're a terrible church. We did not pass out any tracks for Easter. And I, I, I didn't say that, but uh, we just forgot last week. So tracking your tracks, and again, just provoking you, just reminding you to be a witness everywhere you go. I want Mr. Am to come. Very important announcement. Listen closely as uh, what he has to say here. So with our marriage retreat that is coming up, the time for to, that, to sign up for that has ended. Uh, but we had somebody canceled, so there is a space available. So if you were hoping to get involved in that, get signed up in that, uh, but you missed the cutoff for that, uh, somebody canceled, and there is an opening. Uh, so come see myself or pastor or call Nicole at the office, and uh, there's still time for that. We can get you into that one last spot, and uh, we'd love to have that filled in. So if you're still interested in that, there's still time. Uh, get in that spot. The second thing is this. Uh, that was with our school play coming up on the 19th. Uh, they need a lot of days to rehearse. And so actually this evening, they will be, ta will be taking everything out of this room. That includes everything on the platform. So if you have an instrument or something sitting up here, that all needs to be moved off the platform. Uh, if you would like to help us this evening, we're going to tear down the chairs just like we always do, but we also have to take everything off the platform so we can use all hands on deck. Uh, it's a lot of things to move. Also, Mr. C is going to be moving play props uh, from the back storage uh, containers on the back of our property up here. Uh, so if you could stay for a few minutes this evening and help us, that would be greatly appreciated. Growing church, always in transition, always going on. Next Sunday, there will not be a choir because we're actually going to have the backdrop set up. And so we'll have the ensemble singing different things. And try to explain to your preacher friends why you're preaching in front of a Wizard of Oz backdrop, all right? So spin that. Uh, one note, do not touch the televisions or the greenery. Don't touch any of the flowers. Uh, that's got specific hands designated for that because of the value of that. So everything else you can be instructed will remove that. But uh, Brother Courtright? Choir chairs. So if you, will, if you will get the choir chairs, we'll handle everything else from the platform. Leave all the, the speakers and the mics for our, te our tech team because they, they, they uh, want to make sure that's safe. Now listen, uh, big week this week. Be faithful. Be locked in. Wednesday night be in your place. Tuesday night uh, we've got uh, visitation be in your place. Uh, all the different activities. Thursday night, Better Roads Recovery. Uh, went over to, so, uh, as we were leaving the funeral day, saw the Deaf Church coming in. Spanish Church doing well. Uh, exciting days. Be a part. Be busy. Let's all stand together. And uh, traveling music. The lobby's open. The coffee shop's open. Fellowship for some time. Break everything down. God bless you. Spend some time with the Prangers on their way to Alaska. You're dismissed.